Welcome to another YouTube live session. Atal Innovation Mission has been conducting these YouTube live sessions in collaboration with ISRO and CBSC under the ATL Space Challenge 2021. We hope you enjoyed all these sessions that we were conducting through the last four to five weeks across different themes in space. There were knowledge sessions, there were inspirational sessions. And with that, today being the finale session uh, for the ATL Space Challenge, we have two occasions to celebrate, not just we come close, very close towards the end of the Space Challenge, which is ongoing for uh, another week. However, this will be the finale and the last session under the knowledge and uh, inspirational series that we were running. Today's session is also a celebration of the World Space Week, which is celebrated worldwide from 4th to 10th October. And for this session, also keeping the theme in mind for this year and aligning with it, which is women in space, we have a very special speaker with us today. On behalf of Hotel Innovation Mission team, I welcome Dr. Srilatha P for today's session. Dr. Srilatha is presently heading the Human Resource Development Department and is a senior scientist at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. She has a work experience of over 29 years in design and realization of scientific instruments for atmospheric studies. She has closely been involved and has been instrumental in various national level space missions such as the Chandrayaan-1, Chandrayaan-2, Surya Grahan 2010 and many more. For the Surya Grahan 2010, uh, she was a recipient of the ISRO Team Excellence Award. And she is part of various technical expert committees such as the Council of IEEE, Computer Society, and a life member of Indian Society of Systems for Science and Engineering. She has over 100 ISRO internal technical reports, test reports, and technical documents, and around 20 published papers and reference journals to her credit. We are very pleased and fortunate to have Dr. Srilatha join us for our finale session today and inspire and motivate young innovators, especially women, and how they can actually um, take further this, their careers in space and learn more and embark on their journey by hearing from your experiences or story. Over to you, Dr. Srilatha. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Thank you, Dipali. Thank you for the nice words. Hope I am uh, clearly audible. Yes, ma'am. Right. So I'm uh, very, very happy to be a part of this uh, ATL Space Challenge of 2021, uh, which is done in collaboration with uh, ISRO and uh, CBSC. And I understand that I'm the final speaker for this event. And hope all, all the participants have been really inspired by the expert talks already given under this program over the past one month. And I plan to introduce you to another interesting area, which is space research. And I plan to give you a flavor of uh, what all research areas are currently being pursued and where new initiatives are needed as the research is ongoing and also it is to be noted that in space research, the faster we find a solution to a problem, the faster we understand that how much is still not known. So, and I'd also like to add that I am proud to be a part of the prestigious uh, Indian Space Research Organization for more than 28 years now. And uh, during this time, ISRO has also expanded its uh, horizons from exploration of Earth's atmosphere to moon through Chandrayaan 1 mission to Mars with the Mars orbiter mission and again with the moon to the moon with the Chandrayaan 2 and we are working towards the Chandrayaan 3 and the mission to um, understand solar activities with the um, Aditya L1 mission and I'm very fortunate also to have got the opportunity to work on all these planetary missions that I had mentioned and contribute to all the scientific understanding. So let me just start sharing my screen. Hope uh, this is visible. Yes. So, space research, a walkthrough is what I plan to take you through a little uh, walk through the result, through the space research, why, what, and how to do the space research. So, as all of you know, 
space is everywhere and around us and it is eternal, universal and can neither be destroyed nor can be made special. And mankind's interest in space and universe has been triggered from old times, ancient times, with various myths, legends, folklore, etc., all full of stories of space. So let me welcome you to all to this fascinating space through ISRO. I'll start my talk with by paying homage to our uh, Vikram Sarabhai, the great Indian missionary, who is the father of Indian space program who had told that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of the nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society. Mooted with this, we had uh, started our space journey. So, and uh, as already Dipali also has told, this week is very special with respect to space. Why? It is a World Space Week. It, the World Space Week is all, every year it is uh, planned or it is uh, done from October 4 to October 10, where October 4 marks the start of the space era, the October 4 of 1957, with the launch of Sputnik 1. The space era had started, and in October 10, 1967, the UN Outer Space Treaty was done, which details the legally binding rules for the peaceful exploration and use of space. So between 4 and 10, we have every year the World Space Week, and this is coordinated by UN, and every year UN gives a team, and it is celebrated in more than 65 countries. It is basically done to motivate the students and teachers to use space in the classroom and to excite the students about learning. And we have in our Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, we organize World Space Week every year, and we have a multitude of programs wherein we invite the students to participate in lectures and uh, ask them to write essays with this and the students. And uh, we also, from our employees, also there are a lot of and uh, to the students. To the earlier we used to go to school to give the talks, but now in online mode. They register and uh, we give the talk from here. So we are uh, in, encouraging or we are trying to motivate the students to understand a bit about the space, understand what exactly is it about and induce them to start thinking. And the World Space Week also encourages international cooperation in space outreach and education. And in India, it is celebrated all over India under the auspicious of ISRO. And by the way, uh, background I've kept is the Milky Way. Hope all of you know that it is a Milky Way. So you see so much we have to know, so much we have to understand where we are and what space is about. This year's Space Week, we have the theme of women in space. What it exactly means is to show the pivotal role played by women community in the development of space science and technology. So we have uh, the space started with Valentina Tereshkova and all the other famous persons, Kalpana Chawla, Sunita Williams, Sirisha Bandla, all of who were rejoicing, who, were, who had come in newspaper. The rejoicement uh, on the Chandrayaan-1 launch and there are n number of people who are there in space from across the world. Here also we have a good community from India itself. So why do we need space? So I want to point out to be among initial steps for countries seeking to establish indigenous capacities in the development and use of space science and technology and its applications. In short, it just says that space research is the first step any country has to take to start the space activities. So why, what, what are the benefits of that? We can use the science to better understand how and why things happen in our universe and 
which in turn will help to find out what is the technology needed to find to get better science out of this environment. So it eventually leads to technology development also. The space research finds applications in all walks of life, including natural resources management, environmental monitoring, and the satellite-based observational data, they provide an unparalleled view of the Earth for studies related to all environment. So, with this idea of starting research in space, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai found, identified a small fishing hamlet called Tumba in Tiruvananthapuram, near to the southern tip of India, as the ideal place for upper atmosphere and ionospheric studies in 1961. This, from the, this you can see, this is the India map, and here we are in Tumba in Tiruvananthapuram. So, 1961, he identified the place and this place, what the importance of that place is that it is very close to the magnetic equator and is well suited for launching sounding rockets for the scientific studies. The sounding rocket payloads actually play a very crucial role in understanding the Earth and atmosphere. And with that, the first sounding rocket of Nikkei Apache, the name was Nikkei Apache, this was launched from the soils of Tumba on November 21st, 1963. And later on, in 19, within two years, we were able to launch an indigenous rocket from the same soil. And the main thing to note is that one of the uh, highlighted area is that the, there was no office for this, uh, this to function, and there was a big church, so the St. Mary's Church. The St. Mary's Church functioned as the first office for the rocket launch. And the father, Dominic, he was a science enthusiast. So he was, uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the story says that Dr. V. Sarabhai had met the Dominic, um, father Dominic, and uh, he had uh, uh, convinced the father that this is needed for space research in India. And the father has actually played a very big major role in uh, talking with his congregation and asking them to move out of the church and give it for space research. So later on, this uh, the center, Tumba Equatorial uh, Rocket Launching Station and the total center is named as Vikram Sarabhai Space Center in commemoration of the father of science. And this church is now converted into a space museum and holds several models of the various parts of launch vehicle. This is the church as of now. And this is open to public and all school students. And we have almost a 1 is to 40 scale model of the PSLV and the other rockets all here. And the, there are uh, videos and uh, all other models of um, materials all available inside. And every year during World Space Week, a sounding rocket launch is also conducted for the benefit of the public. You can see the public has assembled here to see the sounding rocket launch. So this is the Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station where the uh, mini rockets are launched into outer space. So coming back after the rock first rocket launch, indigenized rocket launch, establishment of ISRO happened with that is the Indian Space Research Organization established in 1969 to focus the talent of Indian researchers into advancing the space program. While keeping abreast with the advancement in technology, ISRO develops various application satellites which are specific to remote sensing, communications, navigation, etc. And there are some of the tools and support for the activities for national importance with the help of the satellite data, which include weather prediction, uh, disaster management, geographic information systems, cartography, telemedicine, e e distance learning, etc. all come under the advance or the outcome of the satellites by ISRO. So now what is so special? Why are we so why the, the space was so special that somebody has to come from Ahmedabad to find a space near Trandrum to launch the satellite? Why? What is so special about the space? So space, it is I mean, we, again it is a very big challenge and the space has different scenarios, different, all the parameters of space are all on the extreme side. Like we have temperatures, on the extreme temperatures, when you go into space, 
uh, when it is near the sun, when this sun is shining, you'll have the maximum temperature. It can go even up to more than 120, 200 degrees. And when the satellite moves or when it goes into the night side, you will have very low temperature because there is no sun. So it can go to negative degrees. So our packages or the our uh, instruments have to function continuously because the satellite will be definitely orbiting. So for some time it will be hot and immediately it will be going to cool. So the fact that the instruments have to withstand this temperature change and they shouldn't function properly also even in this environment. Then we have other things like charged particles. The charged particles are as you go up in the atmosphere, the, the charged particles only exist. There is no specific molecular particles. These charged particles only constitute the movement of ions called the ionosphere, the regime of ionosphere or thermosphere. They have only charged particles exist. And what does this charged particle do? This charged particle affect what all radiate, what all electromagnetic waves pass through. They distort, they absorb or they send them in a different direction. So that what we, what whenever we expect the signal, we may not get them from the particular satellite. So we have to take care of the charged particles. And these charged particles also bombard the electronics that uh, is there, that is exposed in the satellite. So that also creates problems to the working of the electronics. So, and all of us know that when you go up, what happens is the Earth's gravitational force come down. So what exactly is this, uh, how this is important is uh, known only through books. So gravity is a very much important factor or we cannot do a test without gravity when we are in ground. So without gravity, what are the effects of gravity? All are deduced through formulas and all. And with that information, we are making this instruments. Another prop thing is the magnetic field of the Earth. This magnetic field also has uh, distorts or changes. satellites that or the instruments that are passing through it then again we have the very deep vacuum is a vacuum again means there are less number of particles more vacuum so as you go up it is only deep vacuum so how the electronics has to perform in that deep vacuum has to be understood and that also has to be characterized and we have radiation which is meant by other cosmic uh, particles or uh, from other stars and uh, from your sun itself, there are radiations that are coming in. Those radiation also affect the performance of the electronics and the instruments. So in a nutshell, the surviving this environment itself is a great challenge. And yes, I forgot that there is a debris that has been formed around the earth, which also affects the movement of the satellite. And we have to see that no debris hits the satellite. Otherwise, the whole thing gets lost. So coming back, the technology for addressing each of these challenges has to be developed. And then only we'll be able to go up to space. So but how to go in the space? When, when we want to go to space, we have to use a rocket. So what does this rocket do? Let us just see what the rocket does. Rocket, actually there is a video here, which I think it is not playing. Uh, you're not able to see the video, no? Yeah. Uh, so I'll just explain. This is like during rocket propulsion, what happens is when it is fired, that is the video that will be shown here, the, when it is getting fired, the fumes go backwards and the, it pushes the rocket forwards. That is, the rocket expels the hot gas and responds by moving in the opposite direction, which is basically from the Newton's third law of motion, which everyone knows. So I'm sorry, this video is not working. So here, what was shown is like when this flame goes in, this moves and pushes the uh, instrument, this uh, cavity forward. So we have, we all know about aeroplanes which travel in space or which travel above the earth. 
So what is the main difference between an aeroplane and a rocket? So basically the rocket travel at 30 to 40 times faster than the aircraft. And that means a distance of about 200 kilometers will be traveled in less than 30 seconds. And the altitude of the aircraft is generally at around 11 kilometers, while the rocket goes up uh, maybe from 60, 70 kilometers to even 500 kilometers are there. And the major difference is that the aircraft fly within the atmosphere and can take oxygen from air for its uh, movement, whereas rockets have to carry their own oxidizer for pushing forward. So what exactly, how does it happen, the rocket pushing forward? So we have this, uh, this uh, the nozzle of the rocket alone as shown here. Nozzle has a combustion chamber and in that combustion chamber, we have two tanks with uh, one with the fuel coming and the other with the oxidizer coming. This, these are kept at very high pressure, pressurized gases are there. These are controlled and they are taken into the combustion chamber. So what is the property of the combustion chamber? It is all pressurized gases are coming. It has an extreme temperature, which is like more than 100 times that of a normal human being's temperature. Human being has a temperature of 37 with the water boiling point of water at 100 degree and melting point of uh, metals at around 1500. And the 3200 is the temperature around that is the temperature inside this combustion chamber. And we have the extreme pressure also. Extreme pressure, wherein a one bar is our normal atmospheric pressure, as everyone may know. And uh, I, we assume that deep space has zero bar, which is vacuum. And the power that for the tire, we have a three bar pressure. And for this chamber, we have a 220 bar pressure, which is 200 times, more than 200 times the pressure that we normally experience in ambience. So when these two with this high temperature and pressure combined in this combustion chamber, they are ignited and the power that is produced is 37 million horsepower, which is like more than um, 30 times of a uh, locomotive, which takes only about 2,250 kilowatt. And the, this helps to rocket to attain, attain an exhaust velocity of 28,800 kilometer per hour compared to the car's 80 kilometer or the aircraft's 800 kilometers. So this, with this action reaction principle, the whole vehicle is thrust up. We have a gallery of sounding rockets for ISRO. So we started off with the rocket science and the first, very first rocket that was indigenously built and launched from its uh, turrets was the RH-75 rocket, which was a single stage rocket with a length of one meter and it could take a weight of six kilograms with, and a payload weight of just one kilogram and it went up to a height of 6.5 kilometer and the initial RH-7500 and 125 were all like test rockets. After that, it moved on to the RH-200, which is the rocket that is still being flown, which is one of the rockets that is still being flown. But this is basically for meteorological studies. And this is a two-stage rocket which can go up to an altitude of maximum 80 kilometers, which will help to give the wind and uh, other atmospheric parameters useful for meteorological study. From 200, we move on to RS-300, which is again a single stage rocket, but it can take a high payload weight of 50 kilogram, and it can go up to a height of 110 kilometer, which is actually going into the ionosphere or the D and U region of the atmosphere for ionospheric studies. RS-300, it is, it is evolved through 300 Mark II and Mark III, which is being, it is under, still under development. Mark II was recently flown with scientific payloads in, in uh, 2018, and it had gone up to a height of uh, almost 140 kilometers. And from RS-300 Mark II, we have another set of rocket, which is RS-560. You can see the size-wise it is increasing, and the weight-wise lift of mass and the payload mass also is increasing slowly. So this RS-560 is, uh, it can take 
can go up to an altitude of maximum 560 kilometers and take a payload mass of around 100 kilograms. And this was flown also recently for scientific experiments in uh, 2020 March. And uh, another technology that is uh, being tried out is uh, air breathing technology, which is uh, a trial first uh, pilot study has been done, which is basically to take the oxidizer, as I explained earlier, the oxidizer for the rocket we are carrying together, but this is, we are trying, there's a new technology that has been developed to try to take the atmospheric oxygen and how it can be used. So this is still under development and there is a technology demonstration flight that is uh, already on. Moving on from sounding rockets, we have the launchers, which is uh, the first was started with uh, the satellite launch vehicle. Is Four meter and uh, can carry a payload mass of 1,860 kilograms. Where and uh, launch the satellite in sun, either sun synchronous polar orbit or low Earth orbit also, mm -hmm. going up again with payload increasing the payload mass. So we have the GSLV Mark II and GSLV Mark III, which can launch the satellite to the geosynchronous transfer orbit of 36,000 kilometers. I think this was already mentioned by our one of the earlier speaker. That's why I'm not uh, touching more upon this. So, just to show that when the rocket goes, what all technologies are involved. Like we have so many areas that are going hand in hand, that are going uh, in a team work mode to realize this satellite launch. That is, we have. Aerodynamic structural design, mission, closed loop guidance control, use the special materials which has to withstand the temperature pressure and the fabrication also to be done in such cutting edge technologies, propulsion systems, avionics, space ordnance, integration and checkout, which has to which is to test the entire system before it is launched, all the simulations and environmental testing, because before launch we have to do thus those things also, and there is a quality reliability engineering ensuring that precision and accuracy of measurement of the launch. And in most of these areas, we have industry partnership also for development and academy partnership also for all these research activities. Now, let me just say, take you to the scientific payloads for space research. So, what exactly is a payload? A payload is basically a passenger or in the launch vehicle or the satellite. Then we call the satellite as a mothership, and this payload performs a defined function. Whereas in a scientific payload, scientific payload is a special class of equipment. It is designed to develop a spe specific scientific problem. And the measurement of various, like the measurement of various physical or atmospheric parameters. And the scientific payload will have a sensor or a probe, a data acquisition, control, and storage unit, and is definitely interfaced with the satellite. It, the payload also has to be tested for the total performance in a standalone manner before it is integrated. So, scientific payload is nothing but an experiment done in space. On board, some of the uh, one of the space platform like balloons rockets, satellites, or orbiting platform. I'll just give a glimpse, glimpse of, of this, uh, some of these platforms. We will start with the low altitude balloons or the tethersonde and the tethersonde. Low altitude balloons typically go up to a height of one kilometer and they are mainly used for lower atmospheric studies and meteorological studies. They have the sensors for the measurement of wind temperature humidity, all meteorological parameters, and the component that can be used are all similar to laboratory conditions. And each of this system is capable of measuring the atmospheric parameter or the temperature, humidity, and all, and uh, measure the species in situ. In situ means go to that place and measure. That's where we are flying. And then telemetering this data in real time to the ground station where there will be a radar. 
So the total payload weight is almost like less than uh, three kg in a typical case, in typical scenarios, and it has to fit in standard chassis because it, the weight has to be carried by this uh, balloons and uh, hermetically sealed also is like preferable. This, this is electrically interfaced to the standard telemetry. And there, if there is a parachute type, then the uh, payloads are all partly recoverable. And the total time of flight is from 60 to 90 minutes. This the balloons are normally filled with helium and uh, flown and are launched from the uh, center. Here in Turles Trivandrum, uh, BSSC Trivandrum, Turles has this balloon launching facility, which is done every, which we used to do every week. Now it is done as per the scientific requirement. For moving up, we have the high altitude balloons, which are very huge and can go up to 30 to 40 kilometer height. They are mainly used for stratospheric studies, which is above the uh, bottom layer. And this provides a less costly platform to try out any experiments in harsh environment. So a lot of scientific experiments in cosmic ray, X-ray, gamma ray, IR astronomy, astrobiology, atmospheric science have all been done with high altitude balloons, where these payloads are all telecommanded from the ground and uh, their operations are studied. And such a balloon can carry up to 1000 kilometer payload weight. And the maximum duration of the experiment is two to six hours. This payload, the, this payload is normally there only with the TAFR, I think. The TAFR, the Tata, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Hyderabad has this uh, facility wherein they launch this high altitude balloon. And this is electrically interfaced to the standard telemetry. And it is uh, the all the the payload is it should be able to withstand high temperatures from minus 40 to plus 40 degrees. Payloads are all recoverable mostly, and the environmental tests are performed before launch because the payloads experience a change in or uh, minus from minus 40 to plus 40. And same payload with uh, it is reliable for multiple operations. That's why he, uh, big experiments like X-ray experiments and all have also been done. And in an integrated mode, some active tests are done at minus 20 degrees and a 48 hour burn in is done before launch. What exactly is burn in is like continuous operation of the instrument is called burning. So 48 hour burn in means 48 hour will be continuously operating the instrument, which is to be launched on the balloon. Coming to the next platform, we have the sounding rockets, which is the which again was the initiation of our journey. So these rockets are also called as research rockets and they have an instrument carrying the rocket uh, designed that the instrument will be able to take measurements and perform scientific experiments during this uh, short life. It has a very low cost compared to the others and the short lead time for development. Rohini is a series of sounding rockets developed by ISRO for meteorological and atmospheric study. Already we saw the uh, total uh, C series of the sounding rockets earlier. Now these sounding rockets are capable of carrying the payloads from two to 100 kilograms up to from 70 to 500 kilometers. And some of the payloads that we have flown in the scientific, or the scientific payloads that we have flown on these sounding rockets are listed here. So for RS-200, we don't have a specific scientific payload, though the main payload is, the, is called the shaft of the metallic particle. So the metallic shaft will be uh, in, enclosed inside the, in the rocket body. And once it is launched, that shaft will be ejected. So that metallic particles will be moving. That will be tracked by the ground radar. So this movement is actually corresponding to the prevailing wind in that region. So the chaff actually gives the movement of or the wind, direct measurement of wind is done through this chaff study. And RS-200 has also helped to prove many technologies like supercapacitors for pyrotechnics, ignition, encoders and sequencers with solid state switches, programmable DC-DC converters, MEMS-based sensors, 
all have been tested for their survivability and airworthiness in RH200 flights. And we have for the RS300 and RS560 a various probes for ionospheric research. These probes, some of them which I have listed here, are the ones that we have flown from, uh, from the SSC. So one of the probe is called the Langmuir probe, which is having a circular um, sphere, which is almost gold plated. And this will be given some bias or this will be given some low, very low voltage, which it will, when it is in the atmosphere, it will attract the electrons in the atmosphere and produce a current, which will measure, be measured by the electronics. And that will uh, indicate what uh, server, some, the atmospheric parameters. Some another thing is the temperature probe. We have a mass spectrometer, which again measures the constituents of the atmosphere. And there is an electric field probe, which again is measures the actual field. Field again is measured as current only and will be converted to electric field. And the novel electron density and neutral wind probe, which is a unique thing that has been designed and developed by our team, which is called the NV probe. This has uh, two arms and the charge, and it is also biased. And that two arms, the power that uh, the difference with that is measure of the neutral wind and the electron density there. And above all, we have another um, specific payload, which is called the trimethyl aluminum release, which is a uh, specific, uh, which is a special gaseous uh, component, which will be ejected, which will be thrown from uh, at a high altitude, wherein this TMA interacts or reacts with the molecular oxygen with the atomic oxygen that is present in the atmosphere and gives out a specific color color some glow will be coming that glow is actually photographed from the ground and if we have three stations which can photograph the same glow and triangulation method can be used and this will give an indication of the wind the wind performed at the higher altitude this can go up to uh, very high altitudes, even in 560, we have taken recently, it has gone up to almost like 300 kilometers. So this is a glow that was photographed from ground through a uh, high speed camera. So, for the sounding rocket payload, weight is not a prime constraint, and the size is the main constraint. It should be within the nose cone dimensions. Nose cone is the outer shell. The sensor and electronics should have a very fast response because it's all moving very fast and we can use commercial components. Commercial electronics are allowed for the scientific payload, but they have to be qualified using special gate tests. We call them special tests wherein they are taken through a lot of environmental acceptance program and before they are integrated with the sounding rocket. And the total time of flight is 10 minutes, but the data they give is uh, very uh, immense or the value of the data they give is very immense. So that is why it is still being pursued. And I'll just uh, thought uh, one of the uh, one of our missions in uh, during Surya Grahan 2010, this is our rocket uh, body. And here we can see we have flown three instruments. That is the Langmuir probe is here. The mass spectrometer is here with this electronics, and this is the NV probe. And this chassis holds the electronics for both the Langmuir probe and uh, NV probe. And here we have the main telemetry system, and whatever is left here, this is the area where that uh, TMA canister was uh, put. So this was uh, flown successfully. And uh, yeah, once this is assembled like this, it will go into this encasing. And then this is this is the way it will be taken from the final assembly building to the uh, launch pad, wherein it will be assembled. This is actually the launch pad. So this is assembled like this on the launch pad, and the launch pad will be slowly lifted to almost vertical. And it's like around 89, 88 to 89 degrees vertical. And then this will be sent for launch, wherein after this stage burns up, this gets ejected, the top layer get ejected, and all this uh, instruments 
get exposed to the atmosphere wherein they take the measurement before it falls down. So the data was published as a paper in the um, Journal of Atmospheric and Solar Terrestrial Physics, of which I am also one of the co-author. Now coming to the next uh, place where which is which offers the platform is a spacecraft or satellite wherein the payload should have a low mass, low power, operable with DC-DC converters and a small mechanical footprint or low volume, rugged and highly reliable because it has to constantly meet the requirements before and after launch throughout the life of the mission and there is no way of going back and changing anything. Once it is gone to it has gone to space, once it is it is out of our hands, nothing else can be done to make it all right. So we have to see that it all goes well from ground itself, doing a lot of tests. The scientific payloads on board, orbiting satellites are used for the studies on Earth's atmosphere, which include cloud, water vapor, propagation experiments, ionospheric scintillation measurement, electron content measurement, and, and so on. And uh, in, in this area also, I had an uh, opportunity to work in one of the prestigious missions, which is the Youth Sats, which, uh, which is a flagship program involving young minds in space technology and research and was launched in PSLV-16, wherein we had a um, beacon transmitter on board, and that beacon transmitter used to give two coherent signals, which were tracked by or which were received by the ground receivers. This is a typical standard ground receiver which we were using and these receivers were positioned in different locations in our India. From starting from Trivandrum to Delhi uh, to Nainital even, we had positioned our receivers wherein they are along the orbital path of the satellite. So once the satellite moves along this orbit, this we assume the satellite moves along this orbit, then this, the signals from the satellite is received simultaneously in a minimum of three stations. If the satellite uh, is high enough, all will be received by three stations and the result will be that the ionosphere medium which is in between can be studied for its uh, electron density, the scintillation measurements there. So this is a typical result that we have got with this uh, payload data. The payload was called the radio beacon for ionospheric tomography or rabbit and this is one of the results which got published in the um, in indian journal of radio and space physics and uh, this actually means that the uh, electron density is more towards this side whatever is red shows a higher electron density whatever is less is the lesser one so this was uh, this actually basically depends on the time when the observation was done and a lot of things are there but in a nutshell this shows the variation or total cross section of how the electron density varies can be understood with that moving on we have the scientific payloads for planetary mission which were used for measurement of atmospheric composition, detection of new elements, surface topography. So when we move out of Earth, we have a lot of things to understand. We need to understand uh, how the satellite or how the um, planet or our satellite is, moon is our first satellite. I mean, satellite I meant with that. So we have to understand all these things. And the first moon mission first planetary mission of isro was the chandrayaan 1 mission we had so many scientific experiments all of them are scientific experiments and they were all giving on uh, for specific purpose they were all designed and developed for specific purpose they we had collaboration with the uh, us nasa payloads also were there and in fact the the payload from vssc was the moon impact probe or which is photographically depicted here and this is the final picture actual picture of the moon impact probe wherein i had also worked with one of the payloads in this the moon impact probe had three uh, main payloads one was the radar altimeter there was a camera and uh, chandra's altitudinal composition explorer or a mass spectrometer based instrument which had found the direct evidence of water on moon for the first time. So this impact probe was once the uh, orbiter had uh, positioned at 100 kilometer orbit above uh, moon, this impactor was ejected 
and it fell onto the moon's surface. So the data what we had collected was while the moon impact probe was traveling from the 100 kilometer orbit and hitting down to the moon's surface. So that was a very, very valuable 25 minutes and we had total till touchdown, we could get the data of the total flight duration. And that has uh, helped us to give get some publications in uh, highly respectable journals, international journals. We had more than six publications coming in from the Chandrayaan-1. Moving on, we had the mass orbiter mission followed by Chandrayaan-1 was followed by the mass orbiter mission, wherein also there were five scientific payloads from uh, ISRO itself. That is, we have this uh, Menka or the mass accessoric neutral composition analyzer is the payload wherein I could contribute, which was also a mass spectrometer, which was uh, measuring the, which actually it is still measuring, which is measuring the tenuous atmosphere of Mars. And we had the Lehman Alpha photometer, wherein it was uh, asked to measure the D bar H or D, whether there is any isotope of hydrogen present there. That was the purpose of this Lehman Alpha Alpha photometer. Methane sensor to find uh, identify whether there is methane. There is a color camera just giving beautiful pictures, and uh, the infrared imaging spectrometer, which is uh, for understanding the thermal emission measurement of these. Uh, of the from the moon's um, from, sorry from the mass surface, and we have apart from the space, ISRO offers the fourth stage of PSLV launch vehicle as an experimental platform to conduct experiments in a microgravity environment, which is a very innovative area. And this was uh, uh, this is a recent a very recent development. So it's basically like after the satellite ejection from above 500 kilometers. The fourth stage PS4 will be brought back to a lower height of about 350 kilometer, and they will be orbiting around the Earth at a lower altitude than the normal spacecraft. Here also the orbiting was uh, video was there; it is not coming. The total time duration is uh, expected to be maximum of about six months, and the global coverage of experimental data can be obtained even uh, with this, uh, depending on the onboard resources available. And in fact, our ours was the first uh, payload that was uh, tried out in this orbiting platform, which is called the ionization density and electric field analyzer, or IDEA, that was the payload name. So IDEA payload was uh, flown in PSLV C-38, and uh, it was working. At that time, there was not much of the resources available, and uh, we had a good uh, set of data, starting from ground to, uh, the 500 kilometer coming back to 350 and orbiting there for the 10 orbits. That also has helped in publishing the scientific results as a paper, and it has recently come out. And we have still more exciting space endeavors coming up with all mass landing, exoplanets, space habitats, global navig, and whatnot, human missions. So still more unknown and more things to learn. So this entire journey of ISRO, what it teaches us is the value of dedication, sincerity, teamwork, strong desire and vision of the forefathers of the Indian space program, and definitely which is being carried forward now by our generation and the present generation. So this has helped ISRO to successfully scale the heights and one accolades in several noteworthy missions. And as a end note, I would like to say that if you are clear on our priorities, and have an aim of what we need to achieve, we'll automatically find ways to get the balance. Let me stop by saying that, by quoting Carl Edward Sagan, everyone knows Carl Sagan, there are naive questions, tedious questions, oral phrase questions, but every question is a cry to understand the world. There is no such thing as a dumb question. So you should start from questions and try to find the answers. With these words, let me wish you all the very best and thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. So much, Dr. Srilata. It's a very informative session. I'm sure they'll benefit. And for all students, that is just one week before uh, the space challenge on 15th of uh, October. So 
go ahead um, and submit your entries. There are exciting prizes in store for you from ACRO and from CVSC and certificates. We look forward to more. People, I am not able to hear you. Oh, is it? Um, yeah. Please. Are you able to hear me now? Now, now it's okay. Yeah. Okay, I was thanking you, Dr. Srilata, for that informative session that you did. I'm sure students will benefit from it. And um, it is uh, indeed, uh, it's indeed interesting to note all the various things that ISRO has uh, accomplished and the various things that you've accomplished. We hope more and more uh, young innovators embark on this journey soon and uh, benefit from this. Um, with that, I wanted to just add that there is one question we have from later. The question is, uh, what is gamma ray and where is it used? What is gamma ray and where is it used? Not able to hear. Can you repeat it? Sorry. The question was, what is gamma ray and where is it used? Gamma Oh, yeah, so gamma rays are galactic emissions. It is coming from other uh, planetary bodies from stars. So these rays are not used. They, uh, they create havoc with electronics. They have some, basically they have some energy. So they create problems to the electronics and the satellites. So we just need to take care of them and uh, whether they affect, they should not affect our systems. That's why radiation it's part of the radiation of the from the stars thank you so much there is one more question that has come in uh, yeah. the question is after reaching space how does the vehicle or device propel uh, i'm sorry how, after reaching space how does a vehicle propel how does a vehicle propel the propellant is already there so we will be giving command if we need to propel it again. There will be some control command which will be given from the ground. Otherwise, the vehicle itself takes care. There is an autopilot, auto mechanism there which will also take care. And uh, the control commands can be given which will, uh, if needed, that if there is an orbital change or something, we can propel, we can give the propulsion command to. And uh, there are also very positive comments coming in on uh, the informative session that you just did. So on behalf of Atal Innovation Mission, ISRO and CBSC, uh, I thank you for this session today. And I encourage all students to participate and submit their entries for the Space Challenge. It's the very last week. The challenge concludes on 15th of October. You still have one more week to submit your entries. Go ahead and submit your entries. There are exciting prizes awaiting the winners from ISRO, CBSC and AIMS and a lot of um, interesting uh, opportunities you'll get after this challenge. So, so. Um, encouragement and, and best wishes to everyone and uh, congratulations and uh, on the World Space Week and the great work that ISRO has been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity given. I'm so very happy and only thing is that I'm not able to meet anyone in person but still I'm very happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks.